Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Carledge from Animal Training Academy, and it's fantastic to have you along for this next episode, where I can't wait to dive in, because as always, we have another animal training extraordinaire and positive reinforcement practitioner on to talk about all things best practice and to share his stories from training a wide variety of different species. And in this episode, we're going to talk about some areas of animal training we haven't really touched on before, which is going to be super fun. Today's guest came recommended to me by some very close friends of mine and then his name popped up a few times in my news feed again recently after participating in an exciting TV program aired in Australia about the science of modern dog training, which we're going to talk about during the show today. So without further ado, let me introduce one Ryan Tate to the Training Tidbit show. Ryan is a professional animal trainer. He is a qualified marine biologist, zookeeper, dog trainer and trainer and assessor. Ryan runs his own business, Tate Animal Training Enterprises which specializes in detector dog services, animals for the media, zoo consultations, and pet training in classes. Ryan also works for TAFE New South Wales teaching zookeeping and dog training courses. After working full-time as a marine mammal keeper for 13 years and holding the role as supervisor of marine mammals at Taronga Zoo for five years, Ryan decided to become a casual zookeeper and shifted his focus to his own business. Ryan's CV also includes working in Antarctica as a guest lecturer on board vessels, appearing on ABC's Catalyst program as an animal behavior consultant, radio guest speaking on 2UE, and numerous live presentations with his family of animals. And you can add podcasts to that now, Ryan, as well. Yeah. Ryan has five dogs, a Shepherd Cross, Shetland Sheepdog, Australian Shepherd, Springer Spaniel, and a Belgian Malinois, all of whom are trained and actively working in detection from narcotics and invasive pet species to truffles and native animals. The most impressive animal in the family is a pigeon by the name of Alfred, who is trained for free flight demonstrations and media work and seems to have complete control over all the dogs. Ryan has worked with and trained leopard seals, fur seals, sea lions, penguins, native animals, cats, hoof stock, all sorts of flight of birds and many, many dogs. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to the show today, Ryan. How are you? I'm very well, Ryan. Thanks for having me. It's <laughs> going to sound a bit funny going back and forth between Ryan and Ryan, but hopefully our accents set us apart, mate. <laughs> it was getting a little bit confusing in the uh, correspondence before the podcast as well. It sure was, mate. Okay, Ryan, to get started, let's dive straight in. And I was wondering if you could take us back to the start of your learning odyssey and where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and possibly some of the earliest animals you ever trained using it. Yeah, so look, my first recollections of using positive reinforcement came about rather authentically and from a bit of feel as opposed to reading books. I was really into birds as a kid and so is my son, funnily enough enough and it's something that just evolved naturally as I was getting more confident with the birds that I was breeding and housing starting to get them to free fly and I was finding that if I saved and found preferred rewards such as high value seeds or flowers for them when they were coming home that the likelihood of them responding to their cue to come home would increase. And it seemed to make sense to me as a you know 12 or 13 year old kid that, well, why wouldn't they do that? It's their, clearly their favorite reward. So I should save that because the hardest and the most important thing for me was to make sure those birds would come home and go back into their aviary. So that was really, that kind of sparked the excitement in me to think, yeah, you know what, maybe I can use some really positive things to help my birds have a better life, have more time free flying and, and come home on cue when I needed them to. So then that led me into really starting to research about different modes of animal training and got me interested in dogs and then it really got me interested in marine mammal training which when I was a kid kind of seemed like the coolest job in the world. That then led me to studying marine biology and volunteering at Taronga Zoo and that's when I got really introduced into the formal side of operant conditioning, classical conditioning in particular positive reinforcement. So yeah I studied it at uni, I did some psychology and animal behaviour units, it was probably the only units where I really didn't struggle. I didn't find it difficult to grasp the concepts. I really enjoyed learning about Ivan Pavlov and B.F. Skinner and all those other cronies from back in the day. And it really sunk in. I, I loved it. I got really nerdy into the science of it. So yeah, that was going back 16 years ago now when I was studying it formally and never escaped my mind. I use it every day. 
Yeah, really cool. So you flying birds at a young age, what kind of birds were you flying? I largely peach face parrots and also all the lovebirds. And I did have some pigeons and my one of my brothers had a cockatiel as well. So yeah, and just sort of gradually really built up my confidence about free-flying birds. It's, it's something I'm like you, mate, I'm pretty passionate about and I, I really enjoy seeing a bird fly well instead of being cooped up in an aviary all day long. And birds being one of those animals that you have to understand reinforcement well with because they're free flying, right? And they can leave. 100%, mate. That's where I think I kind of really got that solid foundation of understanding the operant conditioning quadrant and understanding that your relationship with that animal and understanding preferred reinforcers is absolute key. And I think it's something that I really try and do every day is don't just accept the status quo that, you know, all beagles will like cabanossi and all parrots will like sunflower seeds. You've got to really test out your animal, get to know it, build that bond and then think, all right, what else can I use to help motivate this animal to to encourage them to do something that they may not be instinctively enjoying or something that may actually make them think a little bit harder and learn. Yeah, cool. And those parrots sound like fantastic teachers for your young mind. And and how do you find going to university? I ask this because a lot of podcast guests share the same stories and so much as they started out with an animal that was at their home or that they came across at a friend's barbecue or something and they started using positive reinforcement intuitively. And then when they started to learn about the science of it, it just clicked in their mind. So how did you find that time at university where you started to actually learn about Uh, all the stuff that you'd already been doing with your parents? I think it really solidified it in my head and it made it very encouraging. I like going and seeing presenters talk, even if they have similar views to me and use similar techniques, to hear their personal experiences and see how it may have evolved over a very long time. We're going back a long way when you think about the Skinner Box and Pavlov and to see how people have proven it and used it to them, I found it really encouraging that, yeah, I'm on the right track and I found better ways to do it and understood the science behind it and really got my head around association times and using a correct bridge and things like that. And that was when it took my animal training to a very different level once I started learning about conditioning a conditioned reinforcer and then using it effectively. And then also though, understanding what motivates natural behavior to occur and things that you see animals do in the wild and you think, how the heck did they figure that out? And then you understand learning theory. And I love going out to the ocean and looking at seagulls or looking at other animals in the environment, fish, and going, how did that behavior evolve? And then you, know, you understand learning theory and you can see why animals will develop peculiar looking behaviors or establish pretty clever ways of corralling fish or hunting or evading predators even you know learning through punishment there i love watching the pigeons fly and avoiding peregrine falcons with a lot of falcons and seagulls around here so watching the local pigeons and seagulls learn and adapt i think makes me a better trainer because I, I like enjoying watching the animals learn in a very authentic way in the wild too. And I'm quite jealous of you having lots of seagulls around. We, we don't have those yeah. in New Zealand. Hey, yeah. so great. And I love learning about what I call people's odysseys. And I think there are so many people listening to this podcast show that are at the start of their own odysseys and wanting to know what is the best way forward. So very cool to hear your stories, Ryan. And thank you so much for sharing. Let's now though, fast forward a little bit because as we mentioned a couple of times, already you were very fortunate to spend time working at one of my favorite zoological organizations in this region and that's Taronga Zoo in Sydney Australia can you maybe share some stories from your time there yeah absolutely mate so I was employed at a pretty unique time when the zoo was undergoing some huge renovation changes employing a lot of new staff and getting an increased collection an increased exhibit side for marine animals so I was pretty lucky at the time that I, I got in employed that I really got thrown in the deep end. I got to really get in there with a lot of different species and do a lot of stuff that honestly I I didn't think I'd ever achieve, let alone within my first year of employment. And one animal in particular that I got to work with and form a pretty strong bond with was a very large Australian fur seal who was very temperamental. We had a strong history of aggression towards people for seemingly 
minor changes in routine and he also suffered skin allergies and he ended up losing an eye through some kind of infection so he was an animal really behind the eight ball and i got to work with him pretty early on in my career usually very very well supervised by my supervisor at the time who really seemed to have a good understanding of that seal and then when he had a series of health issues go wrong and it was decided that we should probably train the animal for routine blood collection and that was probably in my mind at the time completely out of reach completely unrealistic for an animal that was huge You're talking 250 kilos compromised by losing one eye and having itchy skin and then also had a strong history of aggression and aggression that worked he got his way with aggression he would dictate the pace of sessions and try and force reinforcement out of his handlers so i put together with my supervisor a training plan to to train this animal entirely protective contact how to give blood from his rear flipper through a fence so given that you are working 100 percent protective contact in that sort of setting except for the area where we were going to get him to present his rear flipper through you really have to think about what reinforcement can we use for this animal to make something that we know is going to hurt that he doesn't want to do highly reinforcing and predictable enough that we can collect blood on a routine basis to help this animal's health and quality of life so i put together a really long and comprehensive training plan. And I think that sparked my love for training plans. I ran it by one of the head vets at the time, Francis, and spoke to her about my intentions and how we were going to do it. I spoke to other trainers at Underwater World and Sea World about techniques that they would use that would increase the success of collecting blood. And then I really mapped out my training plan. The only kind of punishment I could use for that animal is negative punishment, where I'll, if the animal wouldn't display any correct behaviours, I'd simply walk away, you know. And I think as we were talking about before the podcast, it is important for young and aspiring trainers to know that you can punish your animals in really mild ways unintentionally. But I knew at the time that that was a form of punishment, very mild, albeit. But if the animal became aggressive or wasn't cooperating, I would simply just walk away. He had a very good appetite, which was great. And we started to break down these behaviors into incredibly small steps from something as simple as just capturing any movement of the rear flipper to eventually getting him to literally slam his bum up against the fence, slide that flipper under and hold position for 15 minutes while we heated the flipper, wrapped it in a tourniquet and took blood. So that was my first real training project. And to have an animal that was notoriously difficult and aggressive to train happily and willingly participate in a voluntary blood session and collect blood on a regular basis that ultimately helped his care was for me incredibly empowering and made me so early on in my career realize that, yeah, this was works you know using good rewards building that relationship it really works what a learning curve ryan yeah and um, yeah it was it was massive and poor seal yeah yeah he had a, he had a tough time storm he was born in a storm in melbourne so that's how he got his name really cool to hear about your love of training plans can you yeah. maybe just quickly because i love training plans too i think they have a lot of value just touch on a little bit more about the value you see in writing out training plans especially in a situation like the one you just described yeah i think training plans are essential for any complex behavior or working with any new animal and i'm a bit of a nerd and i love the science so i'll even do it with my own dogs and birds at home for particular projects you know having a long chat with a group of my students at TAFE a few weeks ago about this and saying I think the most important thing in writing a good training plan is number one establishing what are you going to reinforce that animal with and then number two how many small steps can you break that down into that you're going to get your finished product the way that we sort of worked out those successive approximations or the steps that you're going to take for your training plan is at the beginning point one should be what does the animal normally do when it's not under stimulus control and your finish point should be the finished product then all you have to do is fill in all those little steps in between and think well how do i get the animal from resting in a pool or brachiating in a tree to presenting a body part for an injection and holding it there for 10 minutes and so that's how i write training plans i write number one is what would the animal normally be doing and step 100 or 20 or whatever it is is my finished product very cool and there's two more things i just want to talk about that you touched on there ryan if you don't mind yeah, sure. one is that you said you spent considerable time I'm reaching out to others, which I really admire and I think is great. Can you maybe touch on as well the importance of reaching out to others when you're training a new 
behavior, a new species or, or a new animal, or you just want help? Yeah, sure. So yeah, when I was training the blood taking for the voluntary blood from the first hill, I went to Sea World and Underwater World, which is a long way further up the coast from where I live. And I spoke to people that had done it before me with different animals in different environments. And I found out a lot of different backup techniques. So my original technique was going to be just a tourniquet and hot water. And I saw a trainer up in Underwater World called Brendan Knoll, and he would wrap himself under blankets or go into a dark room with the animal and put a torch under the rear flipper. And that would illuminate the potential veins in between the webbing of the flippers. And this is something I'd never seen anyone do before. And he told me that it only works if there are veins running in between the webbing, which there aren't always. But I thought, what a great use of a torch. Another way of trying to find veins instead of forcing them to the surface by using a tourniquet, look through the skin and try and find them. That's what I ended up doing in the end i got like a big old school photographer's cloak and put it over myself and over the seal's rear flipper and then had a little torch and that's how i found the vein there's no way i would have thought of that myself and there's no way i would have gotten blood from that animal successfully so many times without going and seeing someone else do it i'd read heaps of papers from you know from the states and from different places in australia and new zealand as well and yeah no one had mentioned yeah wrap yourself under a towel and use a torch and when i saw it i thought how cool is that and it worked brilliantly for that animal i've tried it since with other animals and it didn't work but for that animal it was perfect that's a great story and what a perfect one to solidify the importance of reaching out to others and you also briefly touched on something we were talking about it before the podcast show and i know you said you wanted to maybe spend a bit of time i'm um, discussing this today and so do you want to talk a bit more about the punishment side of things and what you briefly touched on just then yeah sure so one thing i try and say to a lot of the new students that i'm working with when they're learning about the quadrant of operant conditioning, the positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment. They must understand that that quadrant is always in action. It's always happening. And whilst myself and certainly the majority of my colleagues will strive to exclusively use positive reinforcement, you can't underestimate what an animal deems as punishment. So I know for one of my dogs, he's a very soft dog, brilliantly trained and loves his work. But if I sigh when he gives an incorrect response out of instinct, the dog looks away, he licks his lips and he shows all the signs of a dog that would be punished. Now I've never slipped a check chain on him. I've never whacked him or yelled at him. Me sighing, whether it be at myself or at the dog for an incorrect response, or he's maybe he's missed an odor that he should have found, that is absolutely a positive punishment for that dog he views it as punishment i add the sign to the situation and it decreases whatever he was doing at the time so you know i tell everyone you've got to be really conscious that quadrant is always in action and you may strive to only use one technique and everyone really does try their absolute best to focus on bridging and reinforcing but i think it is important to know that you can use punishment in such subtle ways that you may never realize that you're doing and you need to be conscious of that because you will come across animals that are very very sensitive and you can incorrectly punish them and cause a decrease in a behavior that you don't want to decrease i don't want you to intentionally use punishment i want you to intentionally use positive reinforcement but be aware that punishment is always existing particularly if you're using protective contact or you're using leads and things that prevent animals from going to you or away from you yeah really important information in my mind is what i call pinging with lots of questions right now but yeah. we will move on because of time <laughs> and wonderful stories so thanks for sharing those and i can't wait to hear more from you as we move on to the next question i mentioned at the start of the episode today that we're going to talk about something we haven't really touched on in the show before and that's training animals for film ryan yeah. can you tell us a little bit about your experience here and also really keen to hear additionally about your work doing training detection dogs for concert which is super exciting yeah. so training for film is something that i get asked a lot about at the moment quite a few of my animals are on either television or big billboards around sydney it's been just one of those months where kind of everywhere you look one of my dogs or my pigeon is up on a billboard or on tv and everyone asks me wow that must be so cool it must be so exciting and honestly it, it's a pretty stressful element of the job because some of these shoots that we do we might have a hundred crew on probably a lot more money than i am working by the hour and so when you have something like a bird or say a really soft dog 
like my Australian shepherd and you have a 14 hour shoot ahead of you, you need to be very, very clever about what kind of reinforcement you use. So a lot of people in the film industry will openly admit that sometimes they need to use a bit of pressure and a bit of negative reinforcement or positive punishment to make an animal move from A to B. But when you're dealing with a bird or a very soft dog, my biggest thing is I plan out my reinforcement for the day. So we had a few weeks ago, probably a 14 hour shoot with one of my dogs. And so I start off the morning by going, okay, how am I going to reinforce each behavior? Well, I'll start off the morning with each correct response will be, I'll use the word yay, which is just basically a conditioned reinforcer for affection. And then he'll get mild affection to begin with. And then as those scenes move on, I'll up the affection to cuddles. So he knows the word cuddles on cue. So he runs over and gets a big cuddle. And then once the scenes start to go on for a little bit longer, then I'll go into dry treats. So I know he, he doesn't mind dry treats. And then we start to get a dip in motivation. So then we go into wet treats and then we go into tennis balls and then we go into frisbees and then tug toys. And you balance that out as the day goes on. You kind of have to stage your reinforcement throughout the day, give your animal rests and then maybe start again or mix it up. The biggest thing I've learned from it is you have to have multiple reinforcers for your animal, particularly when you're doing a 14 hour day on set with an animal that you, if you try and force to do something, will shut down. I had a scene with one of my dogs where he had to have some equipment moving around him and had to have a stranger jump out of the dark and then put a, a hard hat on his head. And I just said to the guy, oh mate, just it's late at night. He's not going to love it, but just hold on to the lead. And the first time the guy did it, the dog dropped to the ground and was, you know, holding his head down low and the director said, no, 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 that's not going to work. You know, I, at a time when I thought, oh, surely just this guy can hold on to the lead. I thought, no, oh, that'll do. That'll be fine. No, it looked terrible. And yeah, had to go back to building up his confidence, break it down into successive approximations, have the guy meet the dog first, then appear slowly, then introduce the equipment, then introduce the hat being put on his head. And then within, honestly, five minutes of a bit of positive reinforcement and correct training of an animal that needed to be trained correctly, he aced it. Got a perfect scene director was happy but it was so important for me to go I need five minutes to train this dog in order to get the shot just holding onto the lead and having a stranger jump out was not going to cut the mustard so it's pretty stressful kind of work but it's rewarding when you get to work on good projects and you get your animals through it at the end of the day you feel a very different sense of achievement when you're part of a huge crew that are all relying on maybe a small bird landing on a particular spot or a dog jumping over a fence for a particular scene it's pretty cool to be part of it yeah and the huge crew must love that because they don't see positive reinforcement being implied of animals all the time and suddenly there's this pigeon doing exactly what you ask of it. Yeah, the first shoot I did with the pigeon, the crew sort of said, all right, we'll see how it goes, let him go. And I said, oh, just tell me, where do you want him to fly? And they said, oh, look, like, you know, almost rolling their eyes, said, in a perfect world, he'd fly, he'd land there, he'd look at the camera, wait for five seconds, then fly away. And I went, all right, well, I'll see what I can do. And I baited the spot a couple of times and I put a little marker there for him and then said, right, I think we're good to go, you can roll and they rolled sent him in landed on the spot turned around faced the camera for five seconds and then flew off on cue and i looked around the room and i think everyone's jaws hit the floor and one of them looked at me and swore and said pigeons really smart and i said yeah something like that they just couldn't believe that a pigeon would perform such specific behaviors on cue within a couple of minutes of being described them yeah and i bet they went home and told their kids about that <laughs> <laughs> and we'll remember yeah. that for the rest of their life. That's awesome. Great description there about how to train an animal and keep it motivated. One of the biggest questions I get is how do I train an unmotivated animal? So really nice overview of how you do that for 14 hours, which is pretty impressive. Can we dive into now your work training detection dog? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been training dogs on and off for probably close to 10 years now. Did a bit of experimentation with my own dogs and then I helped good mate and colleague of mine, Steve Austin, with some acquiring some dogs a few years ago and testing out some dogs for different detection purposes and found it's something that I've got a bit of a natural knack for and something that I really enjoy. I find it quite exciting. And probably the biggest basis of training a good detector dog is having that animal feel incredibly empowered to experiment and try new things to get that reinforcement. It's probably one of the areas of training where you really, really need to use your positive reinforcement and be super conscious of any punishment because you're relying on that dog to find something that you can't see and that you can't identify and if that dog at all feel 
feels like there might be a correction, however mild it may be, their ability to think and their ability to smell goes down the toilet. So you need to keep them in that happy state of mind, that willingness to work because they're doing something that you can't do. So that's really what got me into it was because you can't make a dog smell. You can't force them to smell and use their nose and indicate to smell and detect things. You've really got to utilize your absolute best knowledge of positive reinforcement to encourage that animal to track out that smell, target on it and give you a response. So yeah, that's what kind of got me sparked to begin with that I thought, yeah, I can really utilize what I know about training and apply it to an area where I, at the time, I really knew nothing about. As the years have gone on, I've studied a bit more about it and I've spent a lot of time with other trainers out at the army or with national parks detector dogs been down in tassie with the biosecurity dogs as well and helping them a bit but honestly learning a lot from them as well and seeing how they work their animals and how they get their results so uh yeah all of my dogs are trained detector dogs and do work in the field except the oldest dogs pretty much retired now so my australian shepherds finding narcotics and finding truffles as well my shetland sheep dog finds truffles he's an amazing truffle detector dog he was just a family pet that spent most of his time between my mum and my sister's house and he was pretty destructive and pretty naughty and when I was training up the other truffle dogs I thought I'll give him a go I'll let him have a run with us just for a bit of fun he's kind of a very small silly looking dog mate he absolutely aced it it's like a light bulb went off in his head and he thought this is great this is what life's all about and all of a sudden all his little undesirable quirks that he had just started to go out the window he just he found this purpose in life and realized that he was good at something he used to pace a lot used to bark a lot and he'd escape a fair bit too and just run around causing a muck and then it was amazing that once he was given a job and started to feel good and started to get praised and get high reinforcement for using his nose and hunting with me to find these little fungus under the ground he became a completely different dog so he was a real eye-opener for me because I kind of did it as a bit of a joke like as a laugh I thought oh, how funny would it be if Finn that's his name could find some truffles and he's honestly he's better than all the other dogs at it he absolutely nails it and he loves loves it. And as time has gone on, the whole process, the sequence of behaviors themselves are reinforcing. So he finds a truffle at the end and I'll throw the ball or offer him the food and he'll sort of be like, oh, great. Thanks for the ball. Let's go work. He wants the work. He wants that cue to find again. That's his reinforcement as he gets to go again. At the beginning, it was very much reinforcing him with high value food. But now the whole process of being out there with me working is just so reinforcing for the animal. It's a joy to work with one, but I'm not constantly thinking, what am I going to pay him with now? next he just loves doing it so that's pretty cool to, to do that with just the family pet but now it sort of led me on to more serious side of detection with serious dogs that have been bred for that purpose in mind my two youngest dogs are a belgian malinois and a working line english springer spaniel and they are really what we call high drive dogs dogs that have a high drive to hunt and when i say hunt they're not actually biting and killing anything but it's the act of using their nose and running around with their nose down their bum up and and they have very, very high play drive. So they like to be having a tennis ball or having a tug toy in their mouth. And so you can utilize that to get them to experiment, try new things. You know, finding the odors for animals like that, whether it be truffles or narcotics or the Springer Spaniel is working on finding koalas and foxes at the moment. Finding the odor for an animal that driven is a piece of cake. What's difficult is working with the environmental distractions. So ensuring those animals are adequately socialized and aren't scared of things but also aren't prey driven by native animals or lizards or snakes and things that may do harm to them so the act of finding something for a dog like that is honestly a piece of cake but yeah it's the environmental distractions that honestly take up the majority of my training time with those high drive dogs that's really interesting ryan and i know that a lot of people listen to the podcast are challenged with the distractions they face when training their dogs at home so we can only imagine getting a dog out there with snakes and goannas and the eagles and stuff flying around and everything else that's in the bush in Australia and how challenging that would be when training those detection dogs. So really cool to hear about it. And your little family dog that you referred to as a very small, silly little dog. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. really cool to hear about that dog. And just wanted to touch on something else, Ryan, if you don't mind. Something that I think is really cool and really valuable for the podcast listeners, especially the ones working with dogs, is that you said the undesirable quirks that dog had 
previous to being engaged in this work decreased. So can you talk maybe about the importance for some dogs of doing scent work or for doing agility and how those types of activities can assist with undesirable behaviours? I guess it's all really part of that holistic approach to giving an animal behavioural enrichment. And I know with zoo animals and with birds, as soon as they start performing undesirable behaviours, in my mind, the way I approach it is I don't instantly go, well, how can I punish it? How can I extinguish that behaviour? I think, well, what can I do to provide that animal with more enrichment in its life to reduce its desire to want to perform that behaviour, whether it be feather plucking or stereotypic pacing or kennel neurosis? I start to think about the whole picture. And when I get contacted by clients with dogs like my little dog, Finny, that doing things like barking and running around in circles, nowadays my approach is really, well, we need to give it a holistic approach. We need to not only train the animal some incompatible behaviours, some behaviours to perform that less likely to get them to circle or whatever, something like going to a station or going to a bed, but we also need to get that animal's mind working. So I'm huge into behavioural enrichment, but then with dogs, I absolutely love getting them using their nose. It's so much more evolved than ours. Our noses have 6 million receptors. A dog's nose has about 30 million and the part of their brain that's dedicated to smell is 40% greater than... You put all that together and you're talking about an animal who smells things in four or 5,000 times greater quantities than we do. So that's not 4,000 more, it's 4,000 times more than everything you and I smell. And I just think, well, if we're going to give this dog some enrichment, let's use its nose, let's use its superpower. When you start getting dogs engaged in games that encourage them to use that sense and use their nose, it's like their life suddenly makes sense again, um, particularly with highly destructive or high energy dogs. Really simple games, if they like a toy or they like a particular treat, just holding back their collar or throwing that treat into some long grass or behind some boxes like they do in canine nose works and then letting that animal go and use its nose to do what it was designed for. It's just phenomenal. And you see the dog, 10 minutes of searching with their nose seems to do the same effect as like a two hour run. Like I can tell you with my little shelty, he can run all day. If we're playing fetch or we're down at the beach, he can run honestly all day and still have energy to burn. If we're out in the field looking for truffles. I usually give him two or three 20 minute blocks of searching. He is out for the count. He's unconscious. You, you virtually can't wake the little guy up he's so exhausted from two 20 minute training sessions that he just sleeps like a baby and i think it's because we're not only meeting physical requirements but we're meeting the mental requirements and engaging that olfactory system which i think every dog has the desire to do even french bulldogs and british bulldogs i think oh they don't have a very good nose they have an amazing nose they don't have high fitness necessarily they have an amazing nose i've got clients that have their bulldogs searching the house for their keys or finding their phone and doing that great helpful stuff for the family but also brilliant for the dog to use its little brain yeah we're going to talk about that in the next question as well but firstly before we do thank you so much for for sharing all of that ryan i do have a million questions but once again this show must go on so we're going to jump to the next question which revolves around this amazing piece of content made for australian tv recently and that was an episode of a program called catalyst that you were on talking all about the science of dog training ryan for everyone listening can you tell the audience how you got involved with this and a little bit about your experience on the show. Yeah, sure. So the show is a science-based journalism show and they have long had a lot to do with Steve Austin, who if you haven't met him or seen Steve in action, he's probably one of the world's most decorated detected dog trainers. And he's a good mate of mine and a colleague that I do a bit of work with. And Catalyst mentioned to him that they wanted to do this show and he passed it on to his wife, Vicky, who's also a tremendous dog trainer. And then she was unable to meet the requirements of the timelines for the show and she said they should go and have a chat to me so i went through an informal interview process about my understanding of the science of dogmanship and operant conditioning or learning theory and the producers were sufficiently satisfied that i could explain it clear enough to be on television we worked on a bit of a script together with myself and a few other really serious professionals in australia about how can we put together a program that's not only interesting and engaging for the viewers but also really true to the science and dispel some of those myths about dog training being an art. I don't like the term animal whisperer, horse whisperer or dog whisperer. I think it's it really shouldn't be about whispering. It should be about your understanding of learning theory and how you can best apply that to suit your animal or suit your species that you're working with. So that's what we started with. Where I came into it was trying to prove that anyone 
everyone could do it. So as part of the show, we decided to select three regular pet owners who had very poorly behaved dogs and had zero understanding of learning theory. So dogs that couldn't sit, couldn't come. And then we would set them a two-week challenge to train their dogs to be detector dogs, essentially. So each dog was assigned an article that they had to find and they had two weeks to have a dog that would not only search out and find that article, but give them an indication. So let the owner know when they found it, whether it be by holding their nose on the position or sitting next to the article or trying to pour at the article to let the owner know where it was. My job was to essentially be the coach for the owners. I didn't touch the dogs. I didn't handle the dogs at all. I do impart all my knowledge of training dogs and detected dogs onto novice owners and give them two weeks. And then at the end of the two weeks, we had Professor Paul McGreevy from the University of Sydney come out and assess them essentially and see how good the owners and the dogs were. Some people watch and go, ah, surely they didn't do that in two weeks. We honestly did it all in two weeks. Well, they did it all. I was just there for moral support either on the end of the phone or going and visiting their house and watching their sessions and providing feedback. And yeah, we had three regular dogs that were actively searching and indicating on a specific article. And one of the really cool things that we saw out of that program were that two of the dogs in particular that were pretty unsettled, displayed a lot of anxious behavior. By the end of the program, the dog's little chihuahua was significantly more relaxed. It was constantly displaying things like yawning and body shaking and looking for an exit whenever new people were around this dog just started strutting around this newfound confidence and her anxious and nervous displays of behavior were almost extinguished and they were never directly addressed the dog was just given some life enrichment some training some jobs and some fun things to do and these undesirable behaviors that would probably annoy most pet owners naturally extinguished themselves because the dog had a purpose and it wasn't an intended side effect of the show we kind of thought maybe we we might see a bit of that but we really didn't write it into the script and yeah we saw it in the end that this cracking little chihuahua roxy was so much more settled and not displaying all these signals of stress in day-to-day life man that sounds like so much fun what a great opportunity and what a fantastic contribution for the average joe blog pet owner out there to listen to so for your part in that show ryan and on behalf of all animal training Academy's members. Thank you for your contribution to that show, man. I just thought the information was so important and really well portrayed. Thank you. We are sadly now, though, heading towards the end of the episode, whilst at the same time heading towards some of my favorite questions because I'm a huge fan of the stories that get shared on this show. And I get so inspired and learn so much from them, as I'm sure everyone listening does as well. So I was wondering at this point, Ryan, if you could just share with us two or three more stories from your training odyssey and some of the important lessons that you've learned from from them along the way yeah sure so look one of the best stories that springs to mind for me in terms of a light bulb moment for training was trying to train my Australian Shepherd who has a world record for the most dog tricks in a minute to do a stand for inspection so you're talking about an animal that literally has one of the best behavioral repertoires in the world how to train to stand still while someone pabbed him and I thought piece of cake he heals beautifully he stays beautifully how hard can it be to add someone in and this is for a competitive obedience trials that I like to enter because it really puts my money where my mouth is. I go up on a stage against other people and I say, yeah, I'm a professional animal trainer. I'll put my dog through a series of tests that someone else has put in place and see how well we do. And the stand for inspection, mate, it was killing me. I'm talking for a year, right? This dog, every time someone went to approach him in that setting, it's such an unnatural way to do it. The dog would drop his head or he'd move a position and any signs of fear, the dog can be disqualified. And even though he's a working dog, he wasn't necessarily fearful. He would still kind of stoop his head or sort of shy away a little bit or move a foot and I knew we'd lose points. And so the techniques I was using at the time was using positive reinforcement for staying still. And then I would use a lead to block him from moving. So if he went to step out of the way, I'd use the lead to prevent him from moving. And after probably a year of just not getting him past it, he could probably have passed, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I wanted a perfect score at my first trial and I just knew I wasn't going to get it the way it was so I then went and spoke to Vicky Austin who's a very accomplished dog trainer she's had Australian obedience champions so literally the most obedient dogs of their time and she said why not use a play reward what we decided was for him allowing a person to approach him we'd reinforce him by letting him run away and chase a toy so the reinforcer was if someone approaches you I will let you run away and chase a toy you'll never be punished for an incorrect response the lead 
speed goes out the window. I'm not using food anymore. It is if you let someone approach you, I will throw you your ball so you can run away from them. Now, this is a dog that is naturally kind of people shy, not overly affectionate. Within one session, the dog was just going, piece of cake, I've got it. And I filmed the sessions. The dog went from being head stooping, a little bit shuffling, a little unsure of himself to just standing proud, head up, chest out. And within one session, the person's hands all over him, touching him. And he's not flinching at all because he goes, I trust that you're going to let me run away at any moment now and chase a ball. So the reinforcement was so high for the dog that it gave him the confidence to to overcome someone approaching him in a very weird way. And for me, it was a, a cracking light bulb moment to think. It's a simple behavior that I was struggling so much with using a lead and using some relatively high value treats, but letting the dog run away was what he wanted to do. And he absolutely aces that behavior now. So that was a pretty unusual but cool moment for me where I thought, yeah, I kind of need to open my eyes a little more. And, and why I wanted to have that discussion about the quadrants of operant conditioning before, because this is a moment where I thought, yeah, having the dog on lead and using treats should be enough, but it, it clearly it wasn't. The individuality of each animal is something that is unique to their training plan you talked about at the start of the podcast. Can you maybe dive a little bit deeper on what this lesson taught you about how each animal is an individual? Yeah, look, I think that lesson learned there was that don't assume that because you've done it before or you've read it in a book or that someone else has done it a thousand times before that that method and that reinforcer will work for that animal you constantly have to be guessing yourself and your animal about what is it that they really want I mean that's why I love working with animals like hoof stock or smaller prey animals because they teach me that they don't always want the food sometimes they want access to a new area or they want to run away from something or climb to somewhere higher and so I constantly try and re evaluate the reinforcement of any animal I'm working with. And I particularly try and do this outside of a formal training session. I do it with my dogs. I do it with my birds. And Jen and I occasionally hand raise or train animals for zoos or other people as well. And I kind of try and do it every few weeks where I'll hang out with the animal. I might flick a bit of one food. I might throw a different toy. I might give them access to a new area and try all these different things and think, wow, what does this animal go nuts for? Does it go nuts for browse or something like that? and constantly ask myself what does that animal really want and I think when you work with animals that really challenge you mentally they don't want that sunflower seed or they don't want that cabanossi then you start to really open your eyes to other reinforcers that you can use what does the animal go nuts for <laughs> that's yeah. the new reinforcement yeah. detection method <laughs> yeah we now have unfortunately reached the finale of this podcast. I was hoping at this stage that you would take us on a journey into the future and share with the listeners what you would like to see happen in the animal training world in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, this was probably when I read the list of questions, this was probably the one that excited me and stumped me the most. And I changed my answer in my head probably about 15, 20 times, not kidding. I ended up coming to a conclusion on was that I'd like to see the industry be a little more inclusive and supportive. I find it, it can be a cutthroat industry where people will really want to push their agenda or condemn practices of others. And I think it's one of those things where I have learned so much from listening to other people and even someone that I think, oh, I've probably heard it all before. I'll still go and watch their talks. And I would like to see, or I'd hope to see the industry being more inclusive, less segregated, particularly dog training. I'd like to see more conferences where people's from different schools of thought, whether they believe in pack leadership or they think that punishment is the only way to go or positive only force free or you're a bird trainer that uses a lot of luring i'd really like to see all those groups kind of come together and be at workshops and be at symposiums and things like that and be really inclusive there was a couple of facebook groups that i've been added to i'm amazed at people that will swear to be positive reinforcement only will be so hard on each other online and i think use that with your peers <laughs> use your techniques with your peers and try and share that knowledge and probably what's attributed to a large part of my success in my business and my career is that i like people I genuinely like people I want to hear people's stories I want to hear people's different techniques I don't just love animals I don't just want to be surrounded by animals I like being around other animal trainers and hearing their stories and I think that's what I'd like to see more of I'd like to see other people that are willing to share their things and put their neck out and go oh I've tried this I don't know if it's going to work or not don't be afraid to make mistakes and put your techniques out there because hopefully we'll have as the years go on people realizing yeah positive reinforcement works with your colleagues so you know be nice to 
to your colleagues and, and hear them out and try and be constructive when working with other people or reading things online. That's an answer that we get frequently on here. So hopefully through the power of repetition, <laughs> we're, we're all slowly moving towards, uh, hopefully rapidly moving towards the inclusion of positive reinforcement of all species, including ourselves, our colleagues, our friends, our family. Fantastic answer, Ryan. And we will all have our fingers, toes, paws, wings, scales, and whiskers crossed that these things transpire. Like I said, that does bring us to the end, though, unfortunately. This has been so much fun. And from myself and from everyone listening, a massive Animal Training Academy, thank you for being on the show today. It's super appreciated. It's Cheers, Ryan. Uh, thanks for having me on, man. My pleasure. We hope that you out there enjoyed listening to this as much as we enjoyed making it. And one last thing, just before we finish up, Ryan, do you want to tell everyone out there listening where they can find out more about you? Yeah, sure. If people want to connect with me or see what I'm up to, we have a website that my wife and I run with all the animals that we train. And it's called Tate Animals. So you can look it up at www.tateanimals.com. And we're on Facebook as well. If you look up Tate Animals on Facebook, you should find us. And we're pretty active on social media we like to share some of our successes and failures of our animals online and i like to show dodgy sessions that i've done as well as good ones i don't just film it 15 times until i get it right come and check us out on social media or on our website fantastic and i'll link to all that in the show notes as well so it's easy for all you listening out there well i hope you all enjoyed listening to that as much as we enjoyed making it if you haven't listened to the other episodes you can find them and download them either on the website at www.animaltrainingacademy.com or jump over to itunes and find them there as well. Please share this podcast far and wide. The more we can disseminate this information, the better. Also, while you are on animaltrainingacademy.com, make sure to check out all the other amazing resources on offer, including, of course, my labor of love to you guys, the 15 Lesson Animal Training Tidbits free online course. In that course, there's videos, written content, PDFs, audio lessons on getting started, clicker training, target training, crate training, environmental arrangement, reinforcement, measuring behavior, writing shaping plans, and more. So just head over to animaltrainingacademy.com and go to the free course section in the main menu and start learning today. For now though, we'll sign off for this episode. Once again, a huge thank you for listening today and you'll hear from us again soon. Hasta la vista. (laughs) 